hey, Swedish Therapeutare, this is what's left over of Humpty Dumpty's paternal twin. So the last time that we posted was in June. And it seems like a long, long time ago because last week so much happened. <sighs> so um, this is the second skin that is left over from Humpty Dumpty's fraternal twin. So Humpty Dumpty had a problem with uh, integrity. And because the first skin was taken off, the calcium carbonate, so we dissolved that in a vinegar uh, water solution. And what was left was a nice rin, um, example of what was underneath the calcium carbonate shell, which was the second skin, and then maybe even a third skin because we had the yolk. So we had the egg white and then we had the egg yolk. So this is not the egg white. This is actually the fibrous skin that is left over. And that was around the egg to help give it form and protection. And there's another one. So it's fairly transparent. You can see through it. And that's why we can still see the yolk. Now, the thing is, this survived, well, this maintained its integrity, but the stuff on the inside was stinky. <sighs> stinky, stinky. So I wanna uh, share a picture with you because it's easier. This particular egg was hard boiled this morning right here. And just like any other egg, um, can I, no. once we start, once we start cracking into it, that's the first skin and that can be taken off. So I have a picture here and I do have a video, but it takes too much bandwidth up on my uh, computer to show you the video. But so what I've done here is there, there is I'm pulling on that second skin and that second skin lives right underneath the first skin. So just like us in humans, we have our first skin, then we have something underneath it that's pretty much connected to the first skin called the second skin. And then somewhere underneath that we have the third skin. And you've seen my wood before. And what we have is the first skin, a bark, and then right underneath that is like a second skin, um, maybe floam, plume. And we'll talk about that uh, in another video. And then we have a third skin. So just like trees, we have skins. And just like an egg, we have skins. And this second skin is a very protective layer and it's very tough. So I can pull on that with my, my thumb and finger and it can, it, it has this, Mm, elasticity to it. Now, this one doesn't have any more elasticity because it's dry and it's lost its integrity. Um, it can't stitch itself back together again. There's nothing wet around it. It's dry. We have a presentation today so that we can discuss and we can talk about when things blend and when things blur. And we'll talk about my favorite subject, my mom, because it's a subject I know very well. So why don't we just go ahead and share the screen so we can run the slideshow. Yeah, there we go. So today is Monday, July 5th. 
and the Swedish therapist is coming from you from a small fictional town called Get the Bras Mola. Um, happy belated 245th uh, birthday USA. That was yesterday. And that happened in 1776. And then happy anniversary today to my dad and my bonus mom. So that's a pretty cool day. So that's July 5th. And I think that was 2003. Time goes by really fast. And then happy pre-birthday tomorrow to Dr. Sally Sutton, an osteopath that is was well before her time and um, a pioneer of many sorts. And then happy, okay, I don't know French. I only know English and I only knew English as Bastille Day. So when I look at Bastille Day on Wikipedia, it tells me that the French don't call it Bastille Day. They call it Fete Nationale. How'd I do? I don't know. I don't know French. I should have my daughter do that. But that's coming up July 14th. So it's independence. And it is so nice to have independence. <clears throat> yeah. It's also nice to have things that collaborate. It's also nice to have things that don't compromise each other. And when compromising each other, that means it's not really working together. It's very hard to adapt if something is compromised. It's like a border is compromised, your ethics are compromised. <clears throat> So we are going to have part one of episode V. I, I tried so many times last week to make episode V, the vetska, the wet stuff, the in-between smaller, mm, I can't. So we get two versions. So we have V1, vetska and the wet stuff, the in-between, and we have V2 coming up sometime this week. So dear young people and common folk, if you remember the last time that we uh, had a discussion, it was uh, episode U, and that stood for Yuri's metronomes. And these, uh, Yuri was on the TED stage, and I know you can't see that very well, but he's got an awesome TED talk. Um, this is your brain on communication. If you can, watch it because it's fantastic. And at three minutes, he shows us five metronomes. And he says to consider those as a metaphor for five brains and how they go from not sinking to sinking. And you can hear the rhythm and you can hear the click. Well, he suggested five brains because he's a neurologist. So I'm suggesting that we think about those as being the five main perceptions that we have our sensory system. And as you remember from times past, we've talked about um, neurologists and scientists say we have anywhere from 23 to 33 senses, not just the five common ones, but here's the thing. When these common senses, when they sink, when they click in a rhythm, when they couple, it's easier to learn. And there's a fancy science name for that called entrainment. And uh, Yuri helped us explain uh, physical entrainment with the metronomes. And he's a neuroscientist, so he talks about how the brain entrains. And then um, the last time we also talked about Lisa Feldman Barrett with her, um, her black and white pictures and how our eyes neurally entrain us and we learn. So if you haven't seen Yuri's TED Talk, if you haven't seen Lisa Feldman Barrett's TED Talk, TED Talk, go look at the description from episode U because those links are in there. Okay. Then I asked, what happened to my mom? How did she lose her integrity? How, how did she get um, cracks? and leaks in her integral system, like this one. How did it happen? And 
we've had this one many times. Yeah, that's definitely compromised. Definitely uh, the integrity is gone. Okay, so today we're gonna continue our storytelling. And I'm asking you, what kind of story are you telling yourself? So we've been told things, but here's the nice thing. We have our own brain. We decide and we have a choice. Sometimes choices are not allowed and sometimes choices are not easy. I can't help you with either because it's part of life's experience. What I can share with you is, is there was a, a woman in one of my dissection classes that I had in 2016 with Julian Baker. And she, um, she identified as a woman, so therefore she is a woman. And uh, she said, so eloquently, we don't know what we don't know. And, and it seems so simple. But the whole room, it was silent. And, and, and the words just kind of sunk in. And she's right. So I'm going to ask you again. This expression stayed with me for a long time. What kind of story have you told yourself? Is it the whole story? Or is it part of a story? The story. So today we're going to do some storytelling with the ideas of uh, collaborate, which is blending, compromising, which is blurring. Um, I tried to make this as simple as we could, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But in our human body, we have three different compartments. We have a solid, we have a vetska, and we have a gas. Now, Earth is very similar. And there you can see we have land and sea and air. So we're going to observe things in a very awkward, uh, different direction. So if you think in a different direction, we're kind of that, doing that awkward thinking. So let's observe in a different direction and discuss just like open access letters. This is my video letter to you. Swedish therapist video letter to you. So let us talk about blending, blurring, solids, vetska, which is the wet stuff, gases, mindfulness, a little bit, and then my mom. And uh, this last week, so I guess not, today is Monday, July 5th. So um, the end of June, first part of July, which was last week, I listened to um, Johnny Nash's song over and over and over again. And it was so appropriate because we had such heat here in Sweden and then finally the rain came. And when the rain came, it just felt so good. It's like it, it, it broke this pressure and so I started to hum his song because from my experience in the past, I've heard his song. It was sung in, in 1972, that's the year I was born. And this is a picture of uh, Johnny Nash in 1958. And, and the thing is, he's got such passion and he's, it, he must have had some sort of experience that gave him these words. He, he wasn't like a boy band that was put together with a formula. It, it came from his soul. It came from his heart. And he said, and he sings, I can see clearly now the rain has gone, is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. And, and I get that because I had so many obstacles regarding my mom that finally everything was clear. It's, it's like Neo in the matrix when he sees all the green and all the numbers, everything just clicked. Um, so he goes on to sing, uh, gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. And I'm getting goosebumps saying this. 
I think I can make it now, the pain is gone. All of the bad feelings have disappeared. Here's the rainbow I've been praying for. It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunny day. Sunshiny day. Oh. I'm gonna listen to that song more and more because it's very appropriate. Before we go on, let's discuss a few things. Blend is to mix. It's to mingle intimately as the definition says or unobtrusively. It's also to combine into an integrated whole to produce a harmonious effect. But the definition for blur is a smear or a stain that obscures. So unlike Johnny Nash's song, one cannot see. You can't see any obstacles or you don't even know how to get your obstacles out of your path because they're a blur. And then um, blur also means something vaguely or indistinct, uh, indistinct, so it can't be perceived. It's almost like right before the rain came, we could feel heaviness a little bit, but we didn't know what it was. And then finally, after the rain was gone, it felt gorgeous. All right, so. We have another guy who sang this uh, uh, same song from Johnny Nash. Oh, I don't have it there. Oh yeah, there it is. He's another singer, it's called Jimmy Cliff. And he sang the song in the movie called Cool, cool Runnings. And the movie was in 1994. So you can watch this video and that has um, scenes from the, the movie Cool Runnings. But in any storytelling, there is a blend of reality and there's a little smear of truth. But in Cool Runnings, the movie, it's based on a real story, but the movie blurs the truth. So there was a Jamaican bobsled team and they did go to the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. It, it was not composed of track sprinters like the movie depicted. It was instead made of team members that were recruited from the Jamaican army. And the movie depicts these, these team members going to the Olympics as outcasts. But in real life, they were welcomed at the 1998 Olympics. So when we collaborate, we blend, and, and we mix things in a certain ratio, almost like a recipe. And then here's a compromise. It's blurry. It's, it's very hard to see. And this is, I think, mostly where we lose our integrity, which is the state of integral grit. Um, integrity, the, the suffix I-T-Y is French for state of. So integrity, the state of integral grit. So when we blur or compromise, we lose those. And everything plays a part in life. Life has stages. It has life, growth, decay, uh, death and decay. And the stage is like a compartment. There are vast arrays of substances within each compartment um, and they behavior of these substances. Either they blend or they blur, and that determines the next stage. So we can't have one compartment without the other. We can't really have life without growth. We can't have growth uh, and no life. We can't have death and no growth. We can't have decay if we don't have death. So they're all interrelated. Now, my mom, she's in the in-between compartment. She's in between this growth and death stage. So 
Swedish therapist is mindful and I know there's always an end of life. As soon as we're born, we start dying. It is not an easy thing to let go of somebody. I just wanna know, being 80 years old, what, what blurred her integrity? Why did her integrity just disappear? Was there something that could have been done earlier to help her maintain integrity because there's other 80 year olds and there's 87 year olds and there's 90 year olds that have all their faculties up here. And unfortunately, my mom has lost the ability to adapt. Adaptation benefits the whole and she's still my mom, but she's not my mom and she's not whole not the woman I used to know as my mom. We've talked about uh, life and Leonard Nielsen, and it's a, it's a great um, plug for my other uh, episodes that this is episode E. And at six minutes, we talk about seamlessness, how the body is seamless in its whole, but also Leonard Nielsen, a Swede. And you can see here very well that, um, he had a special camera that no one knows because he's, he's met this uh, stage of uh, life called death. No one knows how he took pictures inside the body of living tissue and those living tissues and organisms were not harmed. So this is a real life picture of a fetus an embryo of life in its amniotic fluid and in its sac with all its blood around it. So there's a vetska around it. Swedish therapists, awkward uh, thinking 101. <laughs> our body and our earth have natural compartments divided into just uh, into names uh, like life has. Life has stages. Um, life is a compartment with stages and life, the substances within these stages have complex names. And I guess this would be this mm, stage of life. This compartment would have biologically complex names like phylums, kingdoms, families, and categories. And when we're learning, we put things in parts because to learn in a smaller segment is much easier. Like for example, um, most phone numbers are 10 digits. But if you're gonna say your phone number, usually you divide it up into three, three and four or smaller segments, let's say. And if somebody reads back your uh, telephone number in different segments than what you're used to hearing, it's almost like they're, they, they're right, reading back the wrong number. You know what I mean? So if you take a 10 digit cell phone number and, and it recites three, three, and four, um, these 10 digits are easier to remember. What? Try calling someone with only a portion of those 10 digits. So that's the whole idea. You need the whole number in order to connect. We are whole, we are seamless. We like to divide things up into parts and pieces and segments so we can learn. But life is intertwined. For simplicity, we're gonna talk about our body and it's three natural compartments. We call it a solid, a fluid, and a gas. And a solid is a fiber. And I'm doing this for Julian Baker and all the people in the United Kingdom, British English. Fiber is spelled differently than American English. So if you don't want to use the word fiber, say think of thread or biofilm, because I like the idea of biofilm. It's a film and it's biological. A fluid, Vetska. That's Swedish. A gas, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, helium, etc., etc., etc. 
they blend or they collaborate and they give us life. They blur or they compromise each other. It's disintegral, disintegrity, or dysfunction. So when compartment boundaries blur or smear, integral grit is lost or forgotten. And our body, just like Earth, has compartments. So if uh, we talk about our body being a, having a solid, that would be Earth's land. Our vetska being the sea, ocean, water. Uh, our gases inside of our body would be like air. So Niagara Falls here, vetska has substances within it, in its compartment. And science calls this a solution, when something mixes inside of a, a fluid. I think that's really fun, solution. That should be a solution. A river uh, has many ups, uh, substances living inside of it. So we look at fish, we look at animals, we look at algae, we look at the microbes, and, and we go size difference is also for water. For Vetska. We have a brook, a creek, uh, it flows into a stream, and streams flow into rivers, and they become bigger and bigger, and maybe eventually the river uh, flows into the ocean, where everything blends. And, and it's not only the good stuff blending, mind you. It can be a blur of the bad stuff. I'm from Iowa. And the Mississippi carries a lot of nitrogen and uh, pesticides and herbicides down to the Gulf. And it changes the balance of the algae and the algae and those little smallest pieces of life. Which uh, would be called an excess or a deficiency and simply logo, o logo. So logom is balance, and ologom would be unbalance, uh, balance, no, moderation. O, yeah, O in Swedish before a word is like without or non, N-O-N. That's just a Swedish word. It means fluid. Uh, fluid is the in-between compartment between the solid and the gas stage. Coming here at 43 years old, I had to get really creative with how I was gonna learn the Swedish language. So um, I'm 49 now, so this is gonna be going on my sixth year very soon in August. And, and I'm at the level of a five-year-old when I speak Swedish. Uh, but I've had to be creative in how I remember things. And the word vetska, vet, to me sounds like wet, vet, vet, vet. It sounds wet. And then the ska, I just made that up because how, what would I, how am I gonna remember vetska and what that means? I'm gonna remember it as the wet stuff, which is appropriate because water is water but it's not necessarily, and it could be a fluid, but other things that are not water can be also fluids. So we're gonna say vetska, fluid, wet stuff. Like we said before, our body and our earth has natural compartments. And when they blend or collaborate, that gives us life. And when they blur or compromise, that gives us disintegrity or dysfunction. Oh, here's the gases. Yes, oxygen and hydrogen. Ooh, so you put those in just the right amounts, just a specific ratio of those two gases and you get water. Beautiful. So there's all sorts of gases. I'll see if I can do this. A hydrogen, helium, neon, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Ooh. Oh, I'm gonna start over. Hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, chlorine, argon, krypton, exon, and radon. 
And of those, there are some noble gases, which are colorless and odorless. They're also said to be non-metallic and non-reactive, but I don't know what non-reactive really means because of the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, radon is radioactive. So to me, when it says non-reactive and radon is radioactive, I have to scratch my head on that one. So storytelling, like Yuri talks about, is, is about uh, helping us to learn. Storytelling helps us entrain. It couples ideas and thoughts together. And that's what we wanna do here at Swedish Therapeut. So all of you young people and common folk, you're gonna inherit the world. And I'm sorry adults are so poor in their behavior. I just gotta say that. All adults should go back to kindergarten. So young people and common folk, if you're out there listening, I'll just uh, tell you my experience from farm, Farmland USA in Iowa. We wanted to sell our house in 2015 in order to move to Sweden. We had it on the market in 2014. Finally, we found a buyer 2015 and come to find out a few weeks before we want to sell it we need to have it inspected for radon gas but we've already lived there 16 years of course there's no radon gas but again it's a noble gas which is colorless and odorless so fine we agreed to do the testing because we didn't have a choice we're the homeowner and it comes back with the testing is that it is well above the out okay limit of safety. Really? We've been living there for 16 years and our daughter for eight. What did this radioactive gas do to us? I have my thoughts, but that's a different idea. So we, um, had this mitigation system put in, which is some sort of ventilation from the underground earth, the odorless, uh, colorless gas comes up and then it's piped out and it goes into the atmosphere through a ventilation pipe. So $2,400 later, then we could get the house ready to sell. And uh, uh, I put it in, um, pounds, I put it in euros, and I put it in Swedish krona. That's a lot of money. So noble gases and gases we talked about, but let's go back to the in-between, the wet stuff. There is something called vetska ersat names here in Sweden, and it's another Swedish word. It's kolhydrater, which is a carbohydrate, with electroliter which is a mineral salt in a solution. So electrolytes or electrolyther, but electrolytes are a blend of minerals in a solution. Electrolytes dissolve in a solution and they form ions. Ions are small chemicals with electric charges. So ions can be positively charged. I don't know how to say that. Cations? or ions can be negatively charged and, and, um, and ions. Don't quote me on those pronunciations. But here in Sweden, we have resorb, which is a vetske ersetnings, vetske, vetske, uh, um, a, a wet stuff replacement. And then this is what I bought for my mom and she likes the lemon lime. And Scratch Labs has a great product, but there's lots of products out there. This just doesn't have the added sugar. And she just puts it in her water and she gets good to go for less than $2 for a packet. It's, it was a good solution. Because my mom can only eat now what is being served to her in the nursing home. And she says she likes the food, but if I had a choice, I would put a lot more fresh vegetables and fresh fruit on the, the menu because it has insoluble fiber and it has electrolytes in it. 
and electrolytes if you have a cucumber, if you have um, a, a salad for lettuce, you have a carrot, you have a watermelon, uh, any the vegetable or fruit that's really wet, there's your electrolytes. So if you're eating cakes and cookies and those dry things, that doesn't have the wet stuff. So just keep in mind what you're putting in your system. And if you have uh, like a Coca-Cola that's wet, and yes, it has some sugar in it, but do you get any of the fiber that comes with a fresh fruit or vegetable? No, Coca-Cola hasn't put fiber in their drink yet. Maybe they will. So when we blend electrolytes in our human compartment of the Vetska, it restores bone health, muscle health, brain health all of which are vital tissues that the body needs for life. And I thought this was really cool. The um, modern word tissue comes from the French language, tissure. And that French verb means to weave and that came from Latin, tessier. Lots of things came from Latin, but this French word we use every day in tissue. Tissues are a blend or a weave of these three compartments. So there's solids in tissues, there's vetska in tissues, and there are also gases in tissues. So back to the wet stuff. Our physiology is based on very involuntary chemical processes, meaning we can't think our way out of it. So we've talked about this before on Swedish Therapeutic. The perception of hearing. It is very hard to turn it off. And you hear an alarm go off and, and you're alert. If you hear a uh, whisper, then maybe your ears kind of tune in a little bit more. If you hear somebody yelling at you for the umpteenth number of time, somehow it's a self-preservation mechanism. Those ears just turn off but it's not really voluntary. And I think it's easier to think of um, the body adapting as allostating. And to allostate is everything in a logom state, it's in moderation. And, and if life is going to adapt, it needs to be in this logom, just right amounts. So electrolytes and mineral solids are put into Vetska in a solution. So when we blend in logom portions with tissues, this is good. If we blur, if we get too much electrolyte or too little electrolyte, we also have a problem. That's a blur. So boundaries are compromised. A gas blends with Vetska, tissue, and if two compartments blend, like we've talked about, in the Vetska with electro, uh, um, um, then, then we have an electrochemical response. And that's the next segment we're talking about, pH. So what is pH? Oh, I know, I had to go down this rabbit hole. Woo! Wikipedia and science history, thank you very much. I, uh, I got a lot of good information that I could take and explain in a very short story. So the P means potential or power, but it's, it's debated which one. So the H is hydrogen. So that's why I have P for potential or power and then H is hydrogen. The pH is a measurement, um, is a measured by a scale used to specify a fluid solution's acidity or alkalinity, which is also called Basicity, base. So you can be alkaline or base, same thing. I know, so easy for me to uh, um, get those confused. So the concept of pH was first introduced to us by a, a Danish man back in 1909. And uh, this Danish man, Soren Sorensen, which is Soren Sorensen's son. So his dad was Sorensen and he was named Soren. So he was the son of Soren, that's Danish, Peter Loratz. He worked at Carlsberg uh, Laboratories 
And that's where they made beer. That's Carlsberg Lab. <sighs> Feel free when Denmark opens up, go, go and have a Carlsberg beer, yummy. Okay, so um, in the time of 1909, most science was produced in German, in the German language, but Carlsberg Labs was French speaking and Sorensen actually was Danish. So that's why the P is a little debated on what it means. So the P could stand for the German patents, it could stand for the French puissance, or the Danish potence, which means power, or it could also mean potential. So I guess the basic idea is this is uh, electrochemical power. So when two compartments blend, it gives us pH. So a gas and a fluid, uh, the vetska, the wet stuff is blending. Um, when they blend in specific ratios, it's good. When they blur, they're an excess or deficiency O logome, not good. Because a pH level that's too acidic in the human, the next stage of life is coma or death. And if the pH level is too basic, the next stage is coma or death. So within the compartment of Vetska, life lives and life blends. And this um, and and it's a good thing. And if life blurs, it's a compromise. So we're gonna take this idea of this little beaver, and he loves to eat the sugar off the uh, the the tree of the bark. And look, he has made little homes right along the river at dams. He also lives in the Vetska. And even though man downstream doesn't want the water power to uh, be used like the dam, like the beaver is doing, the beaver needs to have a home. So it's all about collaborating together instead of compromising. So if we keep our storytelling simple. We can refer to the substances blended in the human vetska, the wet stuff, as humoral factors. And why did I pick humoral factors? Of all things, I know. Because I read a lot of science uh, papers, and usually they're the open access ones, and they have all sorts of these chemical things with lots of names and letters, and they're non-alphabetical, and, and it's very hard to say them and, and I think if they get lazy, they say humoral factors. So humoral factors, let's talk more about that because that goes back to ancient Greece when the theory of the four humors was uh, there. So humor, H-O-M-O-U-R, or humor, H-U-M-O-R, I've made a distinction here because in American English, this humor also means funny. And this British English humor, to me, we're gonna say that is part of the humoral factors. That's part of the wet, wet stuff factors, the things, the substances that live in the wet stuff. So let's just talk about Greece for a second. Philosophers, scientists, doctors, politicians of ancient Greece, BCE, before common error, era, and also known as BC, then to the common era, which would be AD. So that's a long span of time. So a, before Christ, BCE, and then after Christ, CE, common era. They did a heck of a lot of observations. That was a huge amount of time. So men like Hippocrates, Aristotle, Eritreus, Herophorus, and Galen, and they're all in chronological order here. So they didn't live necessarily all at the same time, but Galen was part of the common era. But Hippocrates and Aristotle, they were part of BCE. And I think Eritreus and Herophilus, they were part of the common era as well. And they did dissections on criminals that were alive. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit. They helped, all of them helped to develop a theory. 
a story of the four humors to deal with a person's health and pathology. And the four humors was an explanation. It was a way to tell the story of human behavior and human temperament and our features were determined by blending ratios of bodily fluids. And this explanation worked very well. And so when we say humoral factors, that is a fossil, it's a remnant of this theory from way back. It's a model. It was an explanation. So there is a complicated complexity to this theory. I'm never going to do it justice. So this is simple. Um, the four humors explain uh, the, the story of human behavior, the blending of the four fluids with one's age, one's gender, the season, and the time of day explain how the four humors gave behavior to living things. And the four humors related to the four earthly elements which were observed in everyday life. And that was earth, fire, water, and air. And each element blended in a person's blood. Blood was easy to see. Everyone knew that if you cut open an animal or a person, there was blood. So why not have these substances live in the blood? So we had substances like black bile, which was um, black bile, was more of a melancholy state, a depressed state. Yellow bile was an angry state, caloric, caloric, uh, colicky, caloric, angry. Phlegm was more of a calm demeanor, passive. And then blood, sanguine, was more optimistic. Optimistic, strong. Bloodletting, very popular, all the way from uh, uh, from BCE to uh, CE, the common era, common era, and Western based medicine is based in all the theory that went into this huge span of time, BCE and CE. So that was before Christ, BC and AD, on Dono. Uh, Domingo. I don't know what AD stands for. But these practices have evolved and now we have evidence-based medicine as our Western medicine. And uh, that's not only based on observation, but it's fact-checking and then more fact-checking and then more fact-checking and then more fact-checking and not speculative. So they fact-check almost one factor and one factor and one factor. And it's very hard for Western medicine now to see a collaborative factor as a whole. We've gotten really specific. The idea of bloodletting was to restore balance to the um, human bodily fluids, the humors, so that human life could adapt. Um, Ologom, blood would disturb a delicate balance Boundaries would blur and cause excess or deficiency. This issues like illness, pathology, poor physical health, poor mental health, poor behavior, ill effect or ill mood, poor mood was all if this has happened to the fluids, the hu humor, humors. So the theory of bloodletting was to let out a little bit to normalize the whole. And Western medicine employed these traditions up until the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. In, 19, in 1799, retired President George Washington lost 40% of his blood. That's a two liter Coke bottle or two one liter bottles of blood. He lost it because they took it out of him in order to get him better. But they also burned him and they welted him. They fed him stuff that made him poo. I mean, he basically didn't have any vets good left. So he died. 
Okay. Uh, you can read more here. Uh, the mysterious death of George Washington. And then 1865, President Abraham Lincoln, he was shot in the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was also bled. Even though he was shot in the head, he lost more blood because the doctor bled him. So I don't know what killed him. Was it the shot in the head or was it the treatment? Western medicine has employed these traditional beliefs of the humors for a long, long time. And if you're in the 18th century in the USA, that's any year in the 1700s. If you're in the 19th century in the USA, that's any year in the 1800s. And if you're in the 20th century in the USA, that's any year in the 1900s. Sweden does centuries different and to this day, I cannot explain it because I grew up with this. Evidence-based medicine of cause and effect began to gain momentum, but it wasn't soon enough for President James Garfield in 1881 because 16 years after Abraham Lincoln was shot in the head, this president, uh, James Garfield, he died after a longer than two months of being shot. So he survived for two whole months plus a little bit more. And it really wasn't maybe the bullet. There were no di diagnostic tools. X-rays were just coming up. Alexander Graham Bell had a, a rudimentary X-ray machine and he tried to find the bullet, but he had him on a, um, a metal bed where there were springs underneath him. So the X-ray machine was picking up the springs. The, uh, the germ theory by uh, uh, Passeur, uh, Joseph Lister, um, Joseph Lister was thought about, but not really mainstream. So the germ theory wasn't there. And of the 16 medical professionals that were uh, treating James Garfield, um, they didn't wash their hands before they went digging inside of his body. And the nutrition, oh my gosh. I mean, the poor man, James Garfield hated, absolutely hated oatmeal. And that's all they fed him. No eggs, no other nutrients. Uh, it was oatmeal, 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 oatmeal. I don't know. I don't think that sounds very good. And anyway, the medical care from July 2nd when he was shot in 1881 to September 19th in 1881 is kind of a speculation of maybe he died from an infection from the treatment. And when he, um, his weight loss went from 210 pounds, 95 kilos to 130 pounds, 59 kilos. It's a lot of weight to lose in less than two months. There's uh, two sources here. So Bill Bryson is a author and he's a native of Des Moines, Iowa. So you can go there and read more. Oh, I thought this was funny. After Garfield's death, the physician submitted a bill to Congress for 85,000 US dollars in 1881. <laughs> and the senators authorized a payment of 10,000 and then referred to the doctors as facts. Oh, you wanna know why I have this picture here? I have this picture here because uh, people used to be buried in a coffin. Yeah. And if they were buried in a coffin, they had a, a bell uh, attached to the coffin. Um, and the bell was rung if they happened to be buried alive. Because you're down in the ground and you're buried alive, you gotta tell somebody to get me out of here. So I'm glad we have evidence-based medicine. And here's the bottom line. If an organism of any kind loses too much fluid, they vomit, they poo, they pee, or 40% of their blood is taken out, then the tissues like the brain, it doesn't get enough oxygen and other nutrients to support life. So an ologone blending of compartments or a blurring happens. And when blurring uh, can also lead, can be caused by an infection or a virus, COVID-19 virus, oh my. So this bacteria or pathogen, it can blur the boundaries of integrity, which is the state of integral grit, disintegrity. I think that's where my mom went wrong. 
she didn't, but here's Lynette Nielsen. You can look up more about his work and his books. He's a fantastic a Swede. He was amazing with what he did. So please come back, see Vetska, uh, The Wet Stuff Part Two, uh, sometime this week. And then an awkward fact, a cockroach can have its head severed and live for two more weeks because it breathes through its thorax and not its nose like humans. But it doesn't have a mouth or a tube to drink any water out of. So after two weeks time, it dies of dehydration. So take your time to have some water. Take your time to enjoy your summer in the heat. Go get some Resorb or electrolyte replacement. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Be safe.